Please stand in body or in spirit for the reading of the gospel. Today's scripture reading is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, verses 30 through 44. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, Come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. When it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now very late. Send them away so that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy something for themselves to eat. But he answered them, You give them something to eat. They said to him, Are we to go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, How many loaves have you? Go and see. When they had found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then he ordered them to get all the people to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and of fifties. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set, for, to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And all ate and were filled. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. Those who had eaten the loaves numbered 5,000 men. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Please be seated. Thank you, Jennifer. You always do such a great job. So soulful. And Kevin, thanks as always. And thanks for being the band, Don. Appreciate it. Uh, today's sermon title is um, Exactly How Did I Get Here or We Get Here, Part Two. The uh, first, Part One, was my first Sunday here. How exactly did I get here, part one? Because I had told everybody when they asked me what I was gonna do when I retired the first time, is I said, I'll tell you what I'm not gonna do. I'm never, never gonna serve a church for any period of time, ever, ever, no, ever, ever, ever again. (laughs) And then here I am. So here on part two, after this, I am telling you, I'm never gonna serve another church (laughs) ever, 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 ever again. You are the end. You're the end for me. This is it. So, yeah. So, um, I told on the first Sunday, I said, I am, my name is Kurt. We just met. And I'm going to be your guest preacher. And um, I promised you that I would be a good guest, a respectful guest, that I would honor your space. I would honor your history and traditions. That if I move something, I'd move it back. If I mess something up, I'd try to clean it up. And, um, Most important, what's the most important thing about a respectful guest? They don't stay too long. (laughs) So uh, I promised you I'd leave. And uh, yeah, that's what what I'm doing today. I'm leaving. So uh, I said I was going to be here 20 weeks. And you extended my contract to 24. Thank you for that. Uh, I'm on a fixed income. And the extra four weeks of a little salary really helped out. So thank you for the extra four weeks. Uh, Yeah, so 24 weeks and now it's time to go. So um, my first Sunday, I had been here about four days during the week uh, before my first Sunday. I think it was February the 18th. And uh, I want you to know that when you just enter the church family at Manchester, it's a load. You know, there's a lot of things going on. 
and a lot of people. And I, I think I mentioned the first day, Kevin, that there are more people in the choir than some whole church attendance that I did in my past. So that's a lot to have that many people, 80 to 100, behind you. <laughs> and I don't know if you know this, but choir members share about what's going on back there, but they're pretty discreet. And all I knew that I was supposed to do besides preach is what Pastor Andy told me, is he told me where to stand, which was right over there. And he didn't tell me how to get off the stage. I just kind of wandered away. But uh, Pastor Andy has been so great. He's a great, he's just great. Uh, He helped me uh, navigate a lot of complexities here at this big church with so many ministries and so much love. So I appreciate that. Thank you, Andy. You've got a great pastor, don't you? Appreciate him. Uh, I realize today that I, if it's possible, uh, you've been waiting and ready in case I fell down the stairs because I've got these bad knees. And there's one more chance, you know, especially in the contemporary service, you're like, is he going to make it, you know? So, yeah, thank you. And such great staff. We love the music people, Kevin, and the, the choir and the contemporary worship people. You've got great youth group that's uh, right now at the camp. I've got a great children's ministry. Uh, Emily works on that. They had Vacation Bible School, Big Success, Grandma Camp. Just think of all the people that work to, just to keep this building going. Uh, something breaks in this church every day. From a light switch to, oh my goodness, I think that roof's coming down in the rain, which we've had a lot of. And we've, you know there's only two people that do the custodial work here during the week? Can you imagine that? Because, you know, we here on Sunday, but, you know, people come in and out all the time. And all these people are working. We've got people welcoming. We've got people in missions. We've got new people or communications coordinators that are working on internal communications with the church family and external communications. So the whole area will get to know what's going on in Manchester Church. We're going to have a huge witness. Those people are working right now. So I'm just thankful for all that. I'm thankful for you all, too. Uh, I wasn't going to like you. That was my plan. (laughs) You know, it's too hard to leave, you know. I kind of envisioned, I had this kind of word picture in my mouth. It was kind of like skipping a stone. I think I've said it's across a pond. And I was going to do some stuff, but I wasn't going to get down to the heart level, you know, because how many times can you say goodbye? You got to say goodbye to a pastor. Here's another pastor, then another pastor's coming. And that's a lot of emotional drain. So I thought I would just kind of skip along here and do a couple things and, and be gone. But you won me over. You won me over. I don't think I'm a guest preacher anymore. I think I'm family. Yeah. And I can prove it to you. I one Sunday, not too long ago, we were talking about suffering. Remember I got a sermon on suffering, Jesus encountered suffering, and, and I said, you know, I haven't suffered much in life, I, you know, uh, really, and I just have some bad knees, orthopedically I suffer, and I suffered with, uh, over my adult life with depression. And uh, I just said that, this is kind of, you know, we're all suffering at some level. And oh man, after I said that, after church, I had this whole little faith community around me. I had the orthopedic people, they're all giving, yeah, I did, they're going, they were giving me names of their orthopedic surgeon. She's the best. He's the best, you know. One person told me they had three surgeries, knee surgeries. I'm going like, evidently one of those surgeons wasn't that great, you know. <laughs> had to go back in there and fix it. And then on the other side, there were the depressed people, my, my other family, you know. And everybody's telling, you, telling each other what kind, of, what kind of psychotropic drugs we were taking. I take Lexapro, what about you? Oh yeah, I want Lexapro too. So it was nice, you got the arthropods over here and you got the, you know, my depressed brothers and sisters over here. So, so that's when you're family, right? When you cheer doctor's names and tell you what kind of medicine you're on. So yeah, it was really great. Um, every week, if I remembered, I tried to remember that, remember what we said while we were here every week? to just get a little closer to Christ, to be a little closer to Christ when we leave than when we, when we showed up. And uh, that was kind of our mission. And I thought that was a good place to start because it's something we can sort of all agree on, right? That 
you need to be a little closer to God, a little more empowered by Christ's love. And it doesn't mean that, you know, you could be here the first time and uh, you can agree with that and you can be here for 40 years and can agree with that. We need to be closer to Christ. Uh, if you're new here uh, and you're wondering what it's all about and you're wondering if this church can help you, you I'm telling you it can. And I want you to say, I want you to know that if, if you're here for the first time, maybe you have what we really need. And I want to expand it for all of us that we did not get here by accident, not one of us, that we were called by God to be here at this very minute. And that's the truth, to get closer to Christ. Now, I drove up the road here today when I came to church, and I know the sign has been out there probably for weeks, but I read it for the first time, and the sign says, you belong here. I'm going to tell you something. That sign is absolutely accurate. You belong here. Because I don't know if you've noticed it or not, but in our culture, our culture is polarized and divided. We're agreeing with that now? That's not controversial, is it? And we have been able to divide people up for often not very good reasons into every possible way you can divide people. Management, labor, divide by races, divide by age, divide by political affiliation, to be a progressive, to be on the right wing. We divide each other up on sexual practices and talk about that. But I want you to know you belong here and here's why. Because what the world divides up, Christ brings together. True? It's the higher calling above all the ways that we can be divided, that we can be united. They kept saying, well, we need to be, get together and be united. I tell you how you can get to be united. Is try to become a little more like Christ, right? Because that's the unity, because that's above all possible divisions. Doesn't that make sense? That Christ is above all the ways we divide ourselves up. And that is what we need to do. And you must believe that because it's on your sign and we need to live into that, right? Okay. A couple of weeks ago, I gave a sermon on uh, Jesus' first sermon in his hometown synagogue. And if you weren't here, it kind of went like this. Jesus went to his hometown synagogue in Nazareth. It's a town of about three or 400 in Jesus' time. And everybody knew everybody. And Jesus, who was a carpenter in the town, got up as the preacher. And he preached this amazing sermon, this amazing teaching. And the people were in awe that the local town, hometown boy, could be the source of all wisdom. Because Jesus, because Jesus wasn't quoting authorities to make his point, he was the authority. He is the source. He's the source of truth and wisdom from God. And people say, wow, where did he get all this stuff? He's, he just, you know, was around here. And then at some point, we don't know what happened, but the people that loved him started to hate what he was saying. Now, can you imagine? Jesus himself is in the synagogue teaching, and people get mad. They don't like it. Jesus is here today, teaching us, informing us. And I guess sometimes we don't like it. But he calls us on our behavior, right? You ever happen to you in church? Ooh, maybe I just need to change that. Well, the people in Nazareth didn't take that well. And it said that they were so hard-hearted that Jesus could do no great works, but only heal a few people. And we learned in that that Jesus does not force us to do anything, doesn't coerce us, he just invites us to join him, participate in his power, and live the true life that you're called to be. But we also found out in that, that God does not need the synagogue in Nazareth to spread the good news. He can use other people. That's true of every church. True of every church, every denomination. If you don't want to want to go along, it's not going to stop the movement. That's silly. 
So what Jesus did, he showed them. He took the disciples and gave them authority that he had to preach and to teach and to heal and to cast out evil demons. He gave them authority and sent them away from Nazareth to the towns around Nazareth. And they preached with earnest zeal and the people's lives were changed and they lived for a better life. It's amazing. And then Jesus saw the crowds. And he had a problem. You know, if you just have one or two people follow, not a problem. If you have a group of 5,000 to follow you, you've got some logistic difficulties. So he calls a timeout. He says to the disciples, we're going to go take a boat ride, a little cruise. We're going to take a little Sabbath, a little retreat. We're going to go to a deserted spot, like a desert, like a place where we can sit and renew ourselves, kind of like he did after healings and things like that. We're going to sit there and kind of unpack all this, unpack your success. What happened? Now what are challenges? What are the next things we're going to do? And so they go out to this deserted place. And I'll be darned if those people that they preach to see where they're going and run on ahead of them. I don't know how they beat the boat there. It seemed like the people would have to run around and the boat would go straight, but they did. And so the deserted spot for the retreat was not deserted anymore. That there were 5,000 men there, plus the kids and their wives. And when Jesus sees this, It strikes him in his heart. Actually, the Greek word is in his gut, and he has compassion on them. Now, there's another little wrinkle in this. Right in there in a little bit, the scripture says right before this passage that King Herod, who was the king, the sole authority, political authority, in the area that Jesus was preaching and teaching, thought that Jesus and his movement was John the Baptist raised from the dead. Now, King Herod had reason to fear that because King Herod had executed John the Baptist in a particularly horrible way. And to think that John John the Baptist, who was an itinerant preacher, preaching repentance and new life in God, had come back and the ministry of Jesus scared him to death. So the disciples and Jesus tried to go on retreat And here are the things that were percolating in them. Rejection from your hometown and your family. Two, the reality of success. That the delegation of Jesus, of his powers, on common people, the disciples, brought great fruit. And now they had a logistic problem. And then on top of all that, there was the specter that being in the preaching business or the loving business or the Jesus business could be fatal. Take time to think about all that, wouldn't you think? But they go out there and there's all these people in this deserted place, which is no longer deserted. And like I said, Jesus had compassion and he sat them down and he taught them He felt like they were sheep without a shepherd. And sheep without a shepherd, sheep are no good without a shepherd. So they just, they don't do anything. They just flock, I guess. I don't know what sheep do. They just flock. They have nowhere to go. They have no purpose, no direction. But the good shepherd, what? We did it in the 23rd Psalm this morning. The good shepherd leads the sheep, leads them in the grassy places and in the still water and restores their soul. And Jesus felt like he should be the shepherd to the sheep. And he's teaching them. But, you know, the disciples, there's all, and, and we, because they're working on logistics now and crowd size, right? And Jesus is teaching, and they're thinking, wrap this up. Well, they are. There's not a clock, you know, that clock up there on the balcony isn't, that's the preacher clock. And that's no joke. It says, let's go, move it along, move it along. They're moving this along. Let's have a benediction. Because these people are going to be hungry. We're out here in the desert and there's not a McDonald's or a Golden Corral in sight. We've got to feed these people. And Jesus, the great delegator, what does he say? 
He said, well, I'll tell you what, why don't you feed them? You know, kind of like just what you did before, preaching and teaching. I'm going to delegate my power and authority to you, and you feed them. What have you got? Take an inventory. You know what they said? Five loaves, two fish. And Jesus has all the people sit down on the green grass. Now, I don't know how many times I've preached on this in my career. Hundreds of times, right? not hundreds, but many, many times this passage. It's a winner, one of Jesus' you know, biggest hits. <laughs> well, it is. But he says there's one little detail I missed all these years, that he has them sit on the green grass. What is the grass doing out there in the desert? Never, never thought about this before. But it's the 23rd Psalm, right? Makes me lie down on the green grass. There's a lawn out there for the picnic. For the, and all the people were taught. And what seemed like not much was enough for all those people. And the disciples were amazed. And there were leftovers. You remember that? Everybody got fed and there's leftovers. How many baskets of leftovers were there? Twelve. I don't know if this is true, but probably one for each disciple. Right? Who were wondering if there was going to be enough. Not only was it enough, there was abundance. And all the disciples, I just love this, left that place with Tupperware with leftovers in it. It is the best. <laughs> It is just the best idea. Can you imagine the disciples going home, you know, what to eat? And they said, hey, let's, can you imagine eating that bread and fish that Jesus conjured up for you? And what that would mean, what a reminder it was? And probably, if Jesus had taught them correctly, they probably took those, that, those loaves and the fish and shared it with other people. Right? And that teaching and sharing continues and continues and continues and continues to this very moment. So, where are you today, Manchester United Methodist Church? I'll tell you where you are. You're on the grass. You're on the soft lawn. And good news, you didn't have to work on this one. It was just a gift from the Good Shepherd. Right? Can you kind of feel it? Between your toes, maybe rub it. Nah, eh, we're on the grass. We've been taught and fed by Jesus. A new pastor's coming. Right? I'm going to ask you to pray for Reverend, Reverend Beaton and his family. Uh, they've been around here. I think one of the Beaton kids is even on, uh, with the youth today. So, yeah. And you know what he's going to find here? You're going to find abundance. True? Plenty for everybody, leftovers, and the luxurious provisions of that green grass and the still waters for us all. And what exciting news that is. What exciting news of it. So I'm going to give you one mission, because we're in the sharing mission. When you leave out of here today, because we're a bit closer to Christ, right? If you haven't done anything with sneakers for soul, did you hear where they were going to go a thousand shoes, pairs of shoes away? Was that right? To kids that don't have them? That ministry started right here in this church. True? And we're not going to let that not happen, right? They've got one more this week and another week. And uh, either by electronically or by just walking out there and or writing a check if you're like me, old school. And, uh, and why? Because we've got plenty, right? We've got a lot of pairs of shoes. We've got, we're sitting on the green grass. So I'm also going to ask you, going to ask you to pray for the beaten family, okay? Let's pray. Because, you know, there's going to be nothing but restoration and blessing. So... I'm required by the United Methodist Church to say this. I'm leaving now. <laughs> You'd be surprised how hard that is to get ministers to do sometimes. Uh, and I, I'm not going to come back for 
things because you need to have connections with your new pastor, right? And if I come back and do every wedding and every funeral and for Pastor Andy, and you'll never get to know him. So that's the rule. And when I was a supervisor of Methodist churches, I was in charge of enforcing that rule. Pastors didn't need to go. So this is it. Uh, I love you all. I love you in my heart. You took a guest preacher. You took a guest preacher and made him family. And uh, you and I grew little by little, got to know Christ a little bit more, didn't we? That was the plan. Take this time to be with God. Let's pray. Oh, gracious God, um, to be honest, we don't know exactly how we got here, but we're pleased to know that we might have been called here. And this church has done many things for many people, done things for everybody sitting in this room for sure. And our gifts and graces help make this church family what it is. So that's great too, to be called and used. Little by little, let's get closer to Christ. And please, Lord, let us appreciate this moment when we thought we didn't have enough. We had abundance. And we thought it was a dry and parched desert land. And oh, Lord, we're sitting on the lawn. In Jesus' name, amen.